Uh, I, will, I will have more stories to share, but I probably should stop here. Let's welcome Jia for a wonderful talk. Okay. Thank you, Julian, for the overly generous introduction. I, I worry that uh, you know, uh, my talk will not be as good as the introduction. Um, and um, uh, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, um, I think uh, it's been quite a while since I last uh, visited CMU. So, uh, so, so I'm very happy to uh, share some uh, newer work with you. And uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, our work toward an image in that moment for synthetic data. Uh, for me, having image data in the title is kind of special. Um, and uh, so I've actually never given a talk with image data in the title uh, since, uh, like, you know, I, uh, I, I first lo uh, looked for uh, factory jobs. Uh, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of a nice uh, uh, revisiting uh, of uh, ImageNet, although I'm not going to talk about ImageNet. Um, so you might have heard this phrase, uh, the image at the moment of X. Uh, originally, this was the image at the moment of computer vision. This is usually used to mean the demonstration of a powerful recipe that should be very familiar to everybody here. The recipe is that you, know, you have a problem, uh, you get lots of labeled data, and you use such data to train gigantic neural networks and uh, on uh, lots of GPUs. And then you will get uh, very impressive results. Right? As uh, someone I used to say, success is guaranteed. Um, I would argue, actually, that um, this image at that moment has not happened to all of computer vision. In fact, I think it has only happened to a subset of computer vision, specifically uh, the subset around object detection. Uh, that's because for this subset of computer vision, we do have lots of uh, high quality labeled data. Uh, we have real world images, and it's not too hard to annotate lots of labels about objects. Okay? And uh, uh, as AlexNet has demonstrated, right, we could uh, train on such data very large networks and get very, very good results. So the uh, the Ethernet moment, however, has not happened to uh, a very important part of computer vision, that's 3D vision. Uh, for example, a, a canonical task of 3D vision is to give depth values to pixels, uh, for example, from a single image. And the reason I say this image eye moment has not happened for 3D vision is because we don't have all three essential ingredients. Right? One of them is missing, uh, which is lots of high quality label data. That is, you have images and you have annotations of the 3D ground truth. In this particular case, you want the ground truth depth values for the pixels. Right? So why can't we just go out and collect depth ground truth values? Um, this, this is because it's difficult. Um, the sort of only feasible way we know today is to use depth sensors, such as a Kinect and LiDAR, right? basically specialized hardware. Um, there are multiple problems. First, the collection process is very tedious. right? So you have to sort of carry the sensor around with you. Uh, while you're taking photos. Um, a bigger problem is that the depth sensors don't work all the time. Um, uh, they have limited range, meaning that outside a you know, certain distance, you will get no uh, depth observations. For example, you know, uh, the LiDAR on your iPhone uh, maybe can do like one or two meters, but beyond that, uh, it doesn't uh, give you depth values. And also, the resolution is much, much lower than the RGB pixels. Um, also, uh, it doesn't work on certain kinds of surfaces, for example, transparent surfaces or specular surfaces. As a result, uh, we don't actually have uh, very high quality RGBD data uh, that cover a wide range of scenes. Um, so that certainly has blocked the process of uh, 3D vision, for example, single uh, image depth estimation. So even though uh, you can see the uh, visualization of a depth map in 2D, uh, 
uh, as kind of impressive and sharp. But once you actually look uh, the 3D geometry, look at the 3D geometry, uh, it, it's usually very off. There are kind of uh, very uh, severe errors. Uh, so we're actually still very far away from uh, solving this single image depth problem. And this is just one of the many 3D vision problems. Now, uh, are there other ways? Uh, synthetic data uh, is one of the promising uh, alternatives. So here, I would like to emphasize that by synthetic data, I mean data generated by old-fashioned conventional computer graphics. Uh, this is because uh, this term, synthetic data, has taken a new meaning uh, nowadays, uh, which is data generated by AI models. Okay? Uh, because we use synthetic data here is generated by conventional graphics, uh, it's very easy for us to have unlimited quantity as well as automatic high quality labels for many tasks. For example, uh, optical flow from this um, MPI Cintel data set. And um, there is ample evidence that shows that synthetic data can be very useful. And um, in, uh, in some of our past work, uh, we have observed that systems trained entirely on synthetic data can actually work very well out of the box, zero shot, on real world images. So this is very encouraging. And uh, here, you know, I would like to sort of uh, answer this question that you might have, which is why insist on old fashioned uh, computer graphics uh, when generating synthetic data? You know, why don't we just train on synthetic data generated by AI models uh, like, uh, you know, a diffusion network? Well, um, so uh, this is because, you know, I think uh, training AI on data generating the AI uh, can be uh, circular uh, in, in, in a sense that sort of, you know, you are, uh, you, you are improving, your, it's like you're improving self on, your, uh, on the output you generate yourself, right? So when we say, well, I'm trying to improve something, the, the, so it has, there has to be a source somewhere. It can, you know, it, there seems to be limited things you can do by bootstrapping yourself. Um, it, it's not like it doesn't make sense, uh, you know, all the time. Uh, it, it can make sense where you're trying to, you know, copy somebody else's AI or you try to, when you try to downsize an existing AI. Of course, not everybody would agree with me on this, uh, but I, you know, uh, I feel like the uh, old-fashioned graphics would offer you a lot more than uh, synthetic data generated by AI models. All right, um, so you might say, well, you know, what about the domain gap? Right, because you know you probably have seen some existing synthetic data sets uh, with uh, it's like this level of photorealism, uh, and uh, the natural question is, well, you know, it seems like there is a large domain gap, and uh, how do you ensure that uh, system trained on synthetic data would actually work on real data? Uh, wouldn't be very difficult to uh, narrow down this domain gap. Um, the answer I have is that this isn't a fundamental problem because Hollywood has shown us, you know, if you have enough resources, any level of photorealism is actually achievable. You can make it, you know, actually close to zero. It's really just a matter of cost. There is no uh, fundamental technology barrier. Um, that said, existing synthetic data is quite limited. Um, they are limited in detail and realism, and then they're limited in terms of the coverage of the real world, uh, and uh, uh, they have limited labels and may uh, have limited accessibility, meaning that sometimes you have access to the pixels and the annotations, but if you want the underlying 3D models, and you're out of luck, or you have to uh, pay extra. Um, okay, so now, um, you know, maybe we should address the limitations of existing synthetic data. How about, you know, we take an ImageNet-like approach, uh, that is, we go out and uh, uh, scrape the internet for 3D models, right? And people have, in fact, uh, uh, made a lot of effort uh, in this direction. For example, we currently have uh, data sets like ShapeNet and uh, Objectverse, right, which 
uh, scrape the internet for a lot of 3D models, and they have turned out to be very, very useful, and, uh, and many research projects have been uh, using them and uh, have uh, produced uh, very good results right, on certain tasks like you know, text to 3D. Um, however, uh, these ImageNet-like approaches still have some limitations. Uh, this is because fundamentally creating 3D models is much, much harder than snapping photos. Okay? Uh, usually a 3D model on the internet is created by some 3D artist. Right? It takes many hours of work. Uh, it's much more than you know, a, a second that it would take you to snap a photo. Okay? So as a result, uh, the, the amount of 3D models you have on the internet is really, really limited, especially the high quality ones. Uh, and uh, the models you have on the internet, they tend to be objects but not full scenes. And also, uh, you, you typically get static meshes uh, that uh, are hard to modify or control. Right? For example, you might not have a rigging available for you to generate animation for uh, a uh, you know, 3D mesh. So uh, here uh, we are asking uh, in our uh, research whether there is a different approach right, that can address these uh, limitations of existing synthetic data sets. Right? In particular, we'd like something that would offer uh, unlimited quantity and uh, 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 not just objects, but also scenes, as well as fine-grained control. Okay, so now uh, I'd like to just show you a video that introduces uh, our project on generating synthetic data. Uh, this was presented last year at CVPR, um, and uh, uh, the name of the project is InfiniGen. Uh, it is a generator of infinite synthetic data. And uh, note that this is not a static data set. It's really a generator. You can think of this as a generator model, except that there's no AI. Uh, it's purely symbolic insight. So you can have uh, random seeds 
and uh, optional user controls as input, right? And then it uh, can sample 3D things and uh, can render uh, images from these 3D things. Okay, and this is a random sample that's not cherry picked. And uh, a key feature of InfiniGen is that it's 100% procedural. Uh, procedural means that everything is generated from scratch using randomized mathematical rules. Uh, so there is no 3D, there's no static 3D meshes that we download from the internet. Uh, everything is uh, from a set of mathematical rules. Uh, we literally mean everything. This includes shape, texture, material, lighting, scene arrangement, and animation. Okay, animation in also, uh, the, the motion part include camera trajectories. And then there is no uh, neural networks. There is no mysterious array of floating numbers that you don't understand. And uh, just to give you an example, how things can be generated procedurally. Uh, let's say you wanna generate a tree. So what I do is that we write, write a set of rules that uh, determine how the tree would branch, right, from a single stem. And uh, we can then have a separate system that will uh, procedurally generate materials, right? These are also randomized, so, you know, no material is, no true material is exactly the same. And then we have other systems that can generate the leaves, flowers, uh, fruits, uh, that we can put on top of the, uh, tr the, 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 uh, the tree. And so this gives you a single procedural generator for trees and uh, it has many high-level uh, controllable parameters by users. Uh, you can control the height, branch frequency, and leaf density, et cetera. And also it has lots of low-level random variables that don't directly control, right? These uh, determine the exact length of each branch and the exact angle, and uh, uh, there will be uh, the displacement of the geometry to make it uh, rougher. And uh, that those, these you don't direct control, but, uh, but uh, these, these are, that's a lot of randomness uh, that make uh, you know, uh, each tree unique. And uh, InfiniGen is built on uh, decades of computer graphics research and a Blender uh, open source graphics uh, toolkit. Uh, Blender is really a major enabling technology for this project, especially Blender geometry nodes uh, that was introduced in 2021, around the same time we started the project. So the Blender node system uh, is a intuitive way for artists to compose mathematical functions to form a compute graph that will determine the shape of an object or the material of a surface. Uh, so this is a bit like, you know, PyTorch programming where you, you put together different neural network modules, right? That's a differentiable functions and, and to, to form a computer graph. Uh, here, uh, you know, an artist can do the same thing, but in a, you know, graphical uh, interface. Uh, and then there are many online tutorials uh, uh, that teach people how to do this. And so this is uh, uh, just one example of a compute graph for a procedural texture. And uh, uh, to uh, make it even more flexible, we built a node transpiler. What it does is that it turns a uh, node graph into Python code so that, you know, then you can use this piece of Python code any way you want, right? You can have loops, you can have conditional statement, uh, you know, you can compose it with some other uh, uh, systems, and so that sort of make it more expressive and also more friendly to uh, programmers. And uh, another benefit of this transpiler is that now it easily enables open source contributions from uh, uh, everybody. Uh, so you don't have to be a programmer, right? You can just uh, uh, compose some uh, procedural node graphs and then uh, we can automatically convert uh, the, this node graph to Python code. And this is an uh, example. The cloud in the background is actually from the artist uh, released under CC0 license. Um, currently, uh, Infinigen has uh, covered a lot of the natural world. Uh, so we have... Uh, uh, underwater objects, we have plants, uh, we have, you know, trees, we have uh, goofy animals, we have uh, 
also a rigging system for the animals because the animals generated procedurally so we actually uh, just have the skeleton right by construction and then we can uh, add class simulation let's see if this works oh somehow this is stuck okay anyways so so this can actually be animated uh, somehow the animation the video is not showing I'm not sure why and also the the skin deformation you know can be uh, 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 done through cloth simulation and we also have a terrain system uh, so all kinds of different terrains including oceans uh, snow mountains uh, they are generated from the same system uh, using procedural noise and uh, basically you know you uh, procedurally generate uh, 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 SDF or uh, occupancy functions and then you use marching cubes to convert them into meshes and we also have material generators, and these are uh, examples of different materials. And uh, the scene composition system is also procedural, I uh, mean that these are also by uh, rules. Uh, so we first compose a coarse scene. Uh, uh, we have a coarse placeholders for different kinds of objects. And then we ch pick a camera view, and then we populate the scene with uh, the, you know, uh, de detailed assets and then they would be meshed according to the distance to the camera, right, to optimize uh, efficiency. And, uh, and then we'll uh, do photorealistic rendering. Uh, so here, uh, we will use the Blender Cycles ray tracing engine, but you can use other uh, rendering engines. And this is not, this is not like uh, coupled to the system. Okay, so that's the sort of the basics how, of how the system works. Uh, you might have some questions, you know, about, about the system. Um, so for example, you might ask, well, you know, it seems like, you know, you have all these rules that, that, that generate all these different things where everything's handcrafted. Um, how can it ever match the diversity of the real world, right? It seems like the real world is infinitely complex. You know, I mean, it's a very reasonable question to ask, right? So, you know, you know maybe, maybe, you know, you, you will just cover a very uh, narrow, uh, sliver of the real world distribution, this will turn out to be not that useful. Um, my answer is that, well, in principle, this is uh, not uh, a, a barrier because the world is compositional. Okay, this is a quote that I often heard as a grad student. And uh, so to give you an example, right, you might think that, okay, to develop uh, different generators that cover different uh, categories of objects, we will have, you know, these parallel efforts, right? So, you know, there's a thousand object categories We have like, uh, you know, maybe a thousand people each working on a separate, as a separate threat, right, on a different generator. Uh, you, might, you might have someone working on tree generator, someone works on uh, bush generator, and someone, you know, focuses on creature. But this is actually not uh, what actually happened. What happened is that uh, there's a lot of subcomponents actually uh, that can be reused. Uh, so the branching growth generator that, you know, is the same, Right, for both the tree and bushes. And same, the bark generator, the leaves, they can all be reused. And uh, for creature generators, well, you might think it's very different from trees, um, but it turns out there's still lower level utilities that can be reused, right? It's in terms of sort of the basic geometry uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the, the BRDFs. And also, you know, we, you might develop a rigging system for creatures, and it turns out this rigging system can also uh, be used by the tree generator to generate animation for trees. Uh, so basically, the idea is that there are a lot of uh, compositional structure so that you, you actually can reuse uh, the subcomponents and parts that you have already developed. And in that sense, that actually is uh, a much less amount of work uh, to develop the system. Um, on the other hand, right, because of the composition, the diversity of the system actually grows exponentially with the number of generators you have uh, because the complexity is actually a product of the diversity of each generator. Um, so basically, each new generator uh, is really a new dimension of variation that you introduce. For example, a new texture generator right, can augment all existing generators because this texture can be applied all of, uh, to the, all the objects. Right? So as a result, you actually have exponential growth of diversity as you put uh, more dimensions to variations. And this is very, very different from 
uh, static data sets. Right? For example, for image data, when you add a new image, um, the, you, you, know, you, you introduce a little bit more diversity, but the diversity grows linearly because this new image has no impact on your existing images. It doesn't augment your existing images. So uh, here's uh, a picture that uh, illustrates it. Right? Say the real world has infinite complexity and uh, sort of, you know, if you don't have this sequential growth, you have linear growth, and that's sort of, you know, you know over the years, you, know, you might not get too much more diversity. However, uh, if your system is compositional, right, you can have uh, this exponential growth, and uh, uh, it's very possible, you know, uh, very soon, you will reach a level of diversity that can uh, help many practical tasks. Oh, by the way, please uh, feel free to uh, interact me with questions. There was a question in chat, and you can leading up to it. They, uh, they just commented, is there a version of this for urban environments? You have a lot of uh, nature and natural environments. Um, the, the, uh, the, the answer is that we don't have urban environments right now, uh, but that's uh, on the roadmap. But we do have uh, something else that I will show you later in the talk, other than natural objects. Okay, so another question you might have is that, okay, maybe you have enough diversity, but the generator is giving you a particular distribution, right? Um, you, know, d d you know, how close should this distribution be uh, to the real world, okay? I mean, I, mean, um, I mean, intuitively, you know, you should make it as close as possible to the real world, right? Because that's, <coughs> intuitively, that's when, you know, machine learning system will, will work the best. Right, because if the training distribution and test distribution are exactly the same. Um, that uh, s sounds like a very hard problem, right? How can you ever, you know, make sure that it's, it's very close to the real world, right? It sort of generates no more and no less. Um, well, so our uh, position is that uh, we want it to be somewhat close, but not too close, okay? Um, the first reason is that we think it's not necessary for the distribution to be fully faithful uh, to the real world distribution. Why? Uh, because if you look at this photo, uh, this is a dragon from a TV show. This dragon doesn't exist in the real world, okay? But, but you still see the dragon, you can see the 3D shape. Your visual system doesn't fail, right? Uh, and, and it looks pretty realistic to you, as you feel like this could actually exist in the real world. Um, so this says that the distribution our visual system can handle actually is much larger than uh, the distribution of the real world, okay? Um, so, so in other words, actually it's okay for your distribution to, uh, to be approximate or, or slightly larger, right? So you have some kind of domain randomization introduced and which might actually be beneficial uh, you know, uh, from existing evidence, okay? And engineering-wise, uh, it's much easier to approximate the real world distribution as a, like a coarse envelope, okay? Obviously, exactly how the envelope should be uh, is an open research question because we don't that, you know, if it's like too uh, flexible, it's, you know, it's too off, this might have adverse effect, um, but, but, but uh, we think that it's actually not necessary to be, uh, you know, 100% faithful to sort of really trace out the fine boundaries. Uh, and I, I think we think that by having a proximate envelope, this can already uh, provide a lot of value for training uh, 3D vision systems or other tasks. Okay, and another point is that this is because the system is procedural and then uh, you could customize the distribution for each application. For example, you know, uh, should corals only appear in water? Uh, it actually depends, right? Uh, because if your application is only underwater, Sure, uh, or, or you know, you, you have you know, if if there's certain regularities uh, or certain assumptions that you can make for your domain, um, you can certainly make it uh, by by customize the system. Okay, so you have noticed that we only showed uh, natural objects, and natural things, right? So why do we start with that? Uh, the, well, the answer is that you know this is sort of useful on itself, right? Uh, because there are agriculture uh, applications. Uh, also, there are ecological uh, applications. And uh, another answer is more philosophical. Uh, it's because uh, we know that hu the human visual system evolved entirely in nature. Uh, 
So uh, the, the, you know, the, the observation is that you know, the human visual system or, or animal visual system, they don't have to be exposed to artificial objects uh, in order to develop right, or, or function. Um, so uh, we think that you know, if we just have natural objects, uh, they should be sufficient for training uh, the most advanced uh, vision system. Although we might not know how to do it, we might not have the right learning algorithms, but, but, the, but the argument is that uh, such data should, uh, in principle, be sufficient. Okay, here's another evidence is that, you know, we have, uh, you know, we know that birds can really do very intelligent things. Okay, um, so because uh, the infinite journey is procedural, and so it's very easy to get very high quality labels. Uh, so here, you know, you can have very high quality depth maps. Uh, you can have high quality segmentation, very detailed for every single object, uh, you know, 2D or 3D boxes. And then here, this, we, we wanna show some customizability. Let's say you really care about uh, the segmentation of each individual flower petal, and this is easy for you to do, okay? And this would be quite difficult for a menu uh, annotation. And obviously, uh, you can have anything you want, uh, including uh, surface uh, properties, uh, optical flow, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, also, a important feature, uh, a property of the system, is that we insist on using real geometry. That is, we ban the use of techniques that fake geometry that you often see in video games that uh, try to optimize for real-time performance. Uh, this is because we want uh, the 3D ground truth to be accurate. And we also have uh, adaptive resolution scaling so that uh, you know, the mesh resolution would be uh, higher for objects closer to the camera and lower for uh, those farther away from the camera. This is to optimize for efficiency. Okay, um, so uh, how does the sort of synthetic data from InfiniGen compare to other data sets? Uh, this is a very, very sort of uh, a high level overview. Uh, here we can look at uh, data sets at two uh, dimensions. One is the amount of information you have or sort of in terms of annotation uh, for uh, each pixel or image, right? And uh, the other axis or dimension is the uh, breadth of coverage, right? We can think of ImageNet as having very broad coverage of many, many types of objects. However, the amount of information and in terms of the annotation you have, it's actually very limited, right? It's just like uh, one label uh, per image. And uh, for Coco, uh, it has slightly less coverage, but it has a lot more information for each image. It has bounding boxes, for example. Uh, for InfiniGen currently, Right. Overall, it has less coverage than Coco and ImageNet. However, the amount of information you have for each image is a lot more, right? Um, because you know, essentially, you have information on how exactly each pixel is generated. Um, InfiniGen is free and open source. Uh, this means that anyone can use it to generate unlimited, not just images, but also 3D models, right? And uh, uh, the code is modular and customizable. And so this has, uh, in my opinion, a very important implication because this means that data generation is 100% controllable and transparent, okay? So uh, before, we, we're so used to this uh, paradigm where you, know, you take data maybe collected by someone else, which you have uh, not much control over, and then a lot of your effort is spent on optimizing the learning algorithm. Right? That's the code that you, 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 you develop. Uh, and then you, know, you get a machine learning model out of a GPU. Um, but right now, with InfiniGen, uh, with procedural generation in general, the data itself is code. Because you know, a, a data set of a terabyte uh, like a t uh, can actually be compressed or uniquely determined uh, by you know, like 60,000 lines of code plus some uh, parameters and uh, random seeds. Okay, so this means that uh, your data is fully controllable and can be optimized and customized, and you can verify it for security. 
and then you can sort of change it to create adversarial test cases, right? Uh, to, uh, to, to, to evaluate the robustness of the system. You can do many different things. So this opens up uh, uh, like some very uh, interesting and novel opportunities. Um, okay, one question you uh, might already have is about the, the cost of generating the data, right, from the code. Uh, this is the latest version of Finigen. Uh, it takes about two hours on the CPU to make a scene. Uh, that's generating the, the 3D meshes at a very high resolution. And then once you have the 3D uh, scene, and then you can do high quality rendering for the realistic pass tracing. Uh, that's around seven minutes uh, per video frame. Uh, but you can you know, make it much lower if you're waiting to trade off some quality. And then it takes a certain amount of memory. So right now, you know, it's, it's fairly expensive. Uh, however, you know, uh, this is, you know, can still be worth it because, uh, because you do get not just images, uh, but you, you actually get the full 3D mesh. And also, you know, it's easy to share pre-computed data. And then this is embarrassingly parallel. Uh, it can run on a variety of uh, GPUs. You don't have to use A100, right? It can be distributed to, uh, to all the GPUs you have available to you. And of course, we also uh, uh, have faith in uh, NVIDIA and, uh, you know, and uh, Jensen Huang. And then, you know, we think that uh, all the problems will go away, you know, uh, with the next generations of GPUs. Okay, and here's uh, just an example to show you that the cost actually can be fairly manageable. This is a hollow world example. Uh, it just takes 10 minutes to generate on the CPU uh, with a modest amount of memory. You can do this on your laptop. Okay, um, so, well, you know, now you can generate data, but how good is data is, right? how useful is it uh, for training a computer vision model on some downstream task. So far, I have to admit that we have limited uh, uh, results on this because we kind of were busy developing the assets, you know, and sort of we are also bottleneck ourselves uh, by the amount of data we can generate. Uh, so we have, have limited experiments so far. So we have, for example, this is a uh, training on sincere data on, on infinite nature on the natural objects for, for stereo matching, basically depth from, uh, from two, uh, two cameras. And this, we do see uh, sort of promising results, which, is, which tells us that on uh, natural objects, uh, it does work better uh, than all the existing data sets, okay? It's not as, uh, if you're using existing learning algorithm, it doesn't offer you better performance on, you know, uh, artificial objects, okay? But, but on the objects that the data set does have, uh, like trees, uh, you know, other plants, uh, the results uh, is much better. Okay, so, so this means that you know, if, if we do have uh, uh, coverage of, of artificial objects, and this uh, is will very likely uh, give you better results. Okay, um, so right now, it's still early. Uh, so, you know, there, there has, the early time moment for image data has not happened. Uh, but, but, you know, but, uh, uh, but we, we, we hope that uh, as the system matures and, and more data gets generated, uh, and uh, some, something, something interesting can happen. Okay, and people ha have already done uh, uh, things th uh, that are very interesting. Right? For example, uh, th you know, there is a paper on hooking up InfiniGen with a large language model. So large language model would take natural language prompt and generate code that calls InfiniGen API, then generates a 3D scene, okay? Uh, Right, so this is still, you can think of this as test to video, although there is an intermediate stage, right, which is a 3D world. Okay, um, so what is next? So now we're gonna uh, show you uh, uh, our uh, roadmap and, and plans. So uh, we do want to continue to expand the coverage of InfiniGen uh, in terms of both, uh, you know, the diversity as well as sort of the, the, the depth of information, right, for each pixel. And uh, in this upcoming work at CEPR 2024, uh, we expand the coverage of InfiniGen to indoor scenes, okay? Uh, so these are some examples. And uh, we have different kinds of rooms, uh, living rooms, uh, bathrooms. Uh, this might actually, I don't know, this is, may also be a living room, and kitchens. Uh, and sort of uh, just a, a larger sample. And ev again, everything here is a procedural, right? 
uh, every object you see is from mathematical rules. And uh, we can actually export the 3D scenes we generate to real world, uh, sorry, real time simulators. And uh, this is Unreal. Of course, you can also do offline rendering like we were doing for Infinite Gen Nature. Um, but this, you know, real time rendering uh, seems more relevant for robotics applications. Uh, this is just a uh, showcase of uh, assets we currently have. They're all procedural. Right? There you can see appliances. Uh, you can see, you know, kitchen objects. Uh, there are different kinds of furniture. And, you know, there are TV screens. There are, like, uh, paintings uh, on, uh, you, you hang on the walls. Um, and another point about the compositionality of, uh, of the system. Um, here, we can reuse the plants we generated from nature, right? We put them into pots and make them potted plants. And then we can, uh, you know, put corals into these glass containers and make them, you know, trinkets and put them on shelves. And, and because we have na built, made nature, we can actually have, we can make ocean views, uh, that, 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 which are real, uh, as opposed to like, uh, you know, like uh, wallpaper uh, in existing uh, simulators. Okay, um, so in developing this indoor system, we do face uh, more challenges than the, the natural things because uh, indoor things often are very structured. You know, for natural objects like trees and plants, you can just scatter them randomly and then they will look fine. Uh, for, the, for the indoors, you don't, you know, unless you want to make a messy scene, uh, you, you kind of want to place uh, the object sort of in a very structured way, like a chairs around the table. Uh, like object, like uh, you know, nicely arranged, you know, on the shelf. Right? So, so f f uh, to this end, we developed this constraint system, which consists of a specification part, uh, which is the main specific language that allows users to write down the constraints that they want, like you know, how many chairs they want, how many tables they want, and the relationships between chairs and tables, uh, as, as well as other considerations. And then, given these specifications, we have a solver. Uh, that try to satisfy these constraints. Uh, so this design is different from uh, before because it sort of decouples the specification from implementation. Uh, so as a user, you don't have to worry about, oh, how do I write these procedural rules so that you know, it satisfies these constraints. Instead, you can just say, okay, here's what I want, and then you can solve it for me. Um, so here's an example. So here's, here's a, like say, a dining room. As a user, you can sort of use our domain specific language. This is basically Python code uh, to, to express what you want. Here you say, I want two to five uh, shelves on the floor, uh, and I want uh, you know, about one to two tables uh, on the floor. Uh, here you're trying to say, OK, I actually want, uh, you can see there's some distance, symmetry, symmetry scores, angle alignment. Uh, this basically says that I want tables to be away from the walls. I want chairs to be symmetrically arranged and facing the tables. Of course, you can, you know, it's, it's customizable. You can enable or disable these constraints, right? You can say, I want the chairs to be randomly, uh, uh, you know, arranged. That, that's also fine. Okay, and then for the constraint solver, uh, right now it's just a baseline greedy solver. Uh, it's basically that simulated annealing. It tries different moves uh, until it, uh, you know, finds a, a satisf you know, satisfactory solution. Uh, I'm gonna sort of skip over the details uh, because we think, you know, there, uh, there are a lot sort of room for, uh, for optimize this. Uh, but right now, you know, the system is already usable and it, it can create things that satisfy uh, the specifications. And then the layout, so we ha also have a layout uh, system that's separate, right? This can sort of procedurally generate uh, room layouts, in including multi-story houses. Um, and, uh, and then given uh, a layout, and then the constraint system will place the objects, right, in, uh, uh, in, into this uh, floor plan, uh, uh, satisfying the constraints you specified. So these are some examples. As you can see that here, we can actually not only generate rectangular rooms, uh, but also uh, rooms with curved walls. Okay, and here's an example of you writing the constraint uh, language for a warehouse. Uh, so basically, you normally write about 10 to 15 lines of uh, code that specifies what you want to hear. We're trying to say, okay, we want to fit as much stuff as possible uh, in a warehouse. Uh, you know, we. Uh, certain things should go uh, to certain places, and so on. Okay, um, 
So, uh, you know, I also want to share some trivia about uh, 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 building InfiniGen. Uh, it's actually a very fun project uh, because it's a combination of algorithms and math and art, uh, which gives you a better appreciation of the visual world. So one of my uh, students uh, on this project actually sort of used the InfiniGen the system he worked on to generate d d desktop wallpapers. And these are the ginkgo leaves that he made and uh, he made into uh, wallpapers. And also we got to uh, you know, uh, do some actually interesting graphics uh, research. Uh, so here's one example. Um, so this is about sort of mesh extraction from procedural SDFs um, to generate a terrain system. So uh, in our initial solution, what we observed is that there is uh, this flickering effect right, uh, when the camera moves. Okay, you can see that this is, a, you can see the uh, zoom in. You can see the things are flickering. So why is that? Uh, this has something to do with the, the mesh we extracted from a procedural generated sign distance function. And that's how the terrains are constructed. Um, the, the cause is, is uh, mesh switching. Uh, so uh, let me give you some details. So because in Infinity we need to generate unbounded scenes, meaning that scenes with the objects are very, very far away, like, you, like you know, terrains where you can see the horizon, right? So uh, if you do standard uh, mesh extraction, from uh, you know SDF, uh, you would typically what you typically do is to do uniform grid, okay, and then you can do marching cubes to get the mesh. However, this doesn't work for unbounded things because you cannot have a uniform grid that that's for, that's for, that extend to the horizon, right? That would be too expensive. So what you instead should do is to do this uniform grid, but use non-uniform coordinate system. Just, that's spherical measure. Basically, you know the the grid is just so you you have. Uh, it, the grid becomes bigger and bigger w uh, when, you know, further and further away. So this is called spherical measure. And this will work fine in the sense that, you know, the, the meshes, the, the faces of the mesh that, that are closer to the camera will, have, will be small, right? Uh, and uh, the ones that are uh, farther away will be large and it will work for unbounded scenes. However, there is a problem. This only works for a single view, okay? And uh, if you, switch a view with the same, if you keep the mesh, but, but uh, uh, switch the camera to a different view. And then you will observe uh, the very coarse faces of the mesh. And so you kind of lose details and like, like here, right? So you switch the camera, you keep the mesh, you switch the camera view, you move the camera, and then you will observe some very coarse parts of the mesh that were not originally visible. Okay, so that's the problem, right? So you, you know, so the solution would be that you would just do, do remeshing, right? So you, you, uh, you then, you know, recenter your coordinate system, this spherical system, uh, to the new camera location, and then, and then generate a new mesh for the same sign distance function. Uh, but then, you know, unless you do this at ultra high resolution, you're gonna have some aliasing effect because the mesh is, you know, is different. Okay, so here, you know, we just we developed the new solution. Uh, we want to use a single mesh, uh, and this single mesh would work well uh, for multiple views, as long as you know uh, a region of, uh, you know, uh, a, a set of views in advance, right? So basically, you can say, okay, I know the camera is gonna move only in this region, and these are the camera views that I care about, and then we can uh, then uh, create this arc tree, uh, that's a non-uniform grid, uh, that will, uh, will keep all the details uh, for all these known views and then have coarse uh, faces for, for these uh, views we don't care about. And then we can do a marching cube on this non-uniform grid uh, to get the mesh. And this will uh, resolve the flickering uh, effect. Okay, this is sort of, you know, just a side project that, that's, that's, you know, interesting and that sort of we do, uh, the problem that emerged uh, when we tried to do this procedural generation. As you can see, this is the before and after, and now the flickering is gone. And then because of this, we, we can also export uh, unbounded scene, right? That's scene that extends to the horizon to a real uh, time uh, simulator like, like Unreal. Right? And then, uh, you know, maybe you can use this for robotic applications. Okay. Uh, also, during the development of the system, we also, you know, encountered accidental uh, visual uh, optical illusions. And this is, uh, again, uh, Yi Ming, who was trying to develop brick generator. And then uh, he accidentally discovered this pattern where, you know, the, these are actually perfectly horizontal. Uh, but when you look at it, it looks like they are not quite, okay? Uh, I think there's a name for it, but I don't know what it is. Uh, but anyways, so this is fun. Um, 
And uh, currently, we are still actively developing Infinigen. Uh, uh, we're trying to expand the coverage. We're trying to improve usability uh, for uh, different kind of use cases. And uh, you know, we have uh, a Twitter account uh, you, where you can find uh, the latest. OK, um, uh, that's uh, pretty much all I plan to talk about. And uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, my students working on this. Uh, it's, a, it's a large uh, team uh, project. Uh, these are the uh, authors of uh, InfiniGen Nature paper. And then uh, this is the authors for InfiniGen Indoors. And with that, I would like to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Uh, so, in the middle, you had this slide talking about the distribution of images, uh, right? And yeah. in that slide, there was maybe a big claim, I would say, which was that the set of Infinigen generated images was completely subsuming the set of real images. Uh, and so that means that sort of for any real image, the claim is that there is some Infinigen configuration which will yeah, kind yeah. of generate yeah. it. If we go to one of our grad student offices, or I mean, we view this room with this mess here and yeah. sort of weird things there, I assume it's not quite true that current Infinigen can generate this kind of complexity oh, and yeah, yeah. structure, right? Right. So okay. So I should make that clear. That that's not the claim that the current system is able to do that. That's more like illustration that engineering-wise, what you need to build. But in fact, to have a full coverage. To, to say that any image can be in principle generated, that's not a, that's a very easy to satisfy. Yeah, you just have a random program. It must be in the program space. So it's, but they just have very low probability. Yeah, uh, the claim was it's kind of hugging the distribution and is subsuming it. Which, right, right, right. right. Uh, so right. maybe to generate, let's imagine this room, uh, do you think that will happen like the next five years or? Do oh, we need it to happen because we already have indoors. I don't. I think. I think this is. Uh, uh, this is possible already. So people are part, right? Uh, people. Yeah. Okay. I should. People. We are, we we sort of made a conscious decision to to uh, to not do people at the beginning because for people it's like a very specialized uh, like a thing. Like people have developed like uh, parametric models, right? So so I feel like they're not. We don't have to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, I feel like there is already very good. Like people do specialized parametric models for faces, for uh, for for human bodies. Um, so so I feel like there there is already a lot of very good work that we can directly use. But then even ignoring people, right? Like the complexity in this room and the messiness in this room is perhaps a lot more than these sort of rooms with couches attached to walls, as in the kind of indoors rooms that were being shown, I would argue, were much cleaner than perhaps this room, right? I see. So in fact, a structure is much harder than uh, chaos so to generate. So because to make them look orderly is actually harder than, than to have a messy room where just scatter things you know, randomly. So I, I should, uh, I should, there's a, there's, so actually the purpose of the system is not that it gives you a real world distribution. It's like it's customizable and allows you to do real world distribution if you want. So, so the thing is that the distribution is actually not a fixed distribution. So in fact, you can change the distribution. You can, you can customize right, right. it however you want. Yeah. As a, as a new future work, mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to use your tool but yeah. create scenes that look like Coco, sure. can they do it or what are the challenges? I see, I see. That's an interesting question. I think this is a, comes down to some kind of optimization problem because, because maybe for Coco you have uh, annotations about boxes and that will tell you something about uh, 
you basically have a distribution about uh, you know co-occurrences of, of objects and so on, right? Which part, like you, even in 2D, right? You, there's a distribution, and basically the question is like, how do you set the procedural parameters such that these right. distributions match? Uh, this is in principle solvable because uh, you know. If you don't worry about efficiency, this is a black box optimization. You know, you just enumerate all possibilities, then you can solve it. But but we can do something better. Like you know, if somehow you have a gradient, maybe you have a neural network to help you with the search and so on. Right. So in principle, this is an optimization problem that can be well defined. Uh, uh, it's just that like you know, maybe is how efficient you can do the search. Can you insert that in your um, thing? I mean, you just mentioned earlier that you don't insert it. Or so, so what the system gives you is really a set of 3D assets. You give you a thing. The thing actually is the Blender file. You can open in Blender and edit however you want. So, so really, it's not just give you images. It's really the the really end product of rendering, but. But the intermediate, the intermediate steps, you actually have the full 3D meshes that you can use however you want. You can add stuff into it. If you have an existing 3D model, you want to add to it, that's fine. You can change the camera however you want. So basically, you, know, you have a Blender file you can open in Blender, and then you can sort of uh, do whatever you want you know, with, within Blender. Uh, I think I was not 